Sounds good. Okay, Leslie, well, are you going to monitor this class? Or yes. Yeah, I think Tana was just going to watch and see how we do things. Okay, sounds good. Okay. Are you all set for tomorrow then, Tana? Um, and the next day? Um, I can be if I need to be. <laughs> Chelsea was going to do it with me, and we haven't had a chance to even practice, but hopefully I can get a hold of her today and we can. Okay, if you don't, let me know. We'll, okay. get, it, we'll get it fixed. Okay, thank you. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Welcome. Our class today is what every realtor should know about the loan process. It is a two hour CE class taught by Steve Presbury. And I need to just quickly run through the Utah Division of Real Estate Rules. And I apologize for those of you that have heard it numerous times. But in order to get credit, and if you don't want CE, the, CE, the credit, then you're good. This doesn't apply to you. You must have your camera on and you must be in front of your camera for the duration of the class. And your full name must be displayed. If your full name is not displayed, can you change that? So it does show your full name. Uh, three keywords will be given during the class. And I am gonna share um, a Google link about 15 minutes into the class. Click on that so it opens it up and that is the form you will complete with your name, your license number and the keywords. And then that is what, and, and subject to, like I said, you knowing the keywords and being on the camera, you will get the credit. So I think that's it. Um, enjoy the class. There is a chat. I know Steve likes to engage people and ask questions. If you have a question, don't hesitate to interrupt and ask it, or you can ask it through the chat. And I will try and keep on top of that to monitor that as well. Enjoy the class, folks. Thank you, Leslie, and welcome aboard, everyone. Uh, particularly those of you who are joining us for the first time, we welcome you to this Presidio Raising the Bar class. Um, let's see if I can just get my machine working here. Here we go. So this class is on know what every realtor should know about the loan process. It's um, it's class six out of a, a, a series of 12 classes that we have for raising the bar. Um, and I'll just quickly run through those uh, little rules again from the division in case someone's just joined us. Uh, basically, uh, display your full name on the screen and have your video turned on. Uh, be in attendance for the whole class. Be seen and engaged for the duration of the class. And during the class, I'll submit three keywords, which you will use in your submission at the end of the class. To help me remember those, I've got my little uh, poodle here. He, he pops up every now and again. Let me see if I can see where he is. He should be there, actually. Whoops, where's it gone? How come this has got stuck? Interesting. I'll just pull out and pull back in. Let's see. If this will load in. <clears throat> There he is. So when that keyword comes up, I should give you a keyword. Um, so that'll happen three times during this class. So these, um, these classes are called Raising the Bar in Presidio. We are keen to raise the bar from wherever we are. I encourage all of you from whichever brokerage you represent is to look at ways in which you can become a better realtor. Um, Hopefully education can help us become better in this industry and raise the bar in everything we do. Um, our principal broker is Jennifer Yeo, and she um, has said this, this is her kind of mission, doing the right thing in every area of our jobs only makes the industry better as a whole. Staying committed to that helps us all have a strong, resilient, long-standing career and will bring more referrals and business to you than 
you can ever imagine. That's why at Presidio, we all pledge to raise the bar. So that's what hopefully we can do today as we look at this subject. I found an interesting um, quote that I thought I'd share with you. It might be appropriate for us to think about as we look at the loan process and uh, banks and institutions that loan money. This is from Robert Lee Frost, who was an American poet. He said, a bank is a place where they lend you an umbrella in fair weather and ask for it back when it begins to rain. I thought that was quite an amusing quote. Um, when, we, when we borrow money, we're always at the mercy of the lender. But it's nice to know what the rules are. Hopefully we can be sharper um, as we go through this class. So certainly ask any questions. Um, just unmute and butt in. I won't respond to the chat, um, but Leslie Ann will respond to the chat. And if there's a question that we need to share with everyone, then she will she'll raise that for us. Uh, but I like to make these classes uh, interaction as possible. Uh, you all have good ideas. I know we have some new agents on this class. We also have some very experienced agents who have lots of um, good comments and stories to share. And I hope you'll be able to share those with us today. So this is the title of the class. Know what every realtor should know about the loan process. And particularly, we're talking about our mortgages for buying homes. We'll overview the following. We'll look at the loan process in some detail. We'll look at credit scores and how to understand how the credit scores work, what we can do to probably increase our credit score and hopefully when we're working with our clients, particularly our buyers, we can help them to work closely with their lender so that they can qualify for a, a good interest mortgage loan. And we'll also cover a few do's and don'ts at the end of this lesson. So the loan process, it's quite detailed. And so some of the things we'll cover, we'll talk about, first of all, the initial conversation with a loan officer. Um, and that's very important. We'll talk about the loan application, the initial disclosures. Uh, we'll review some of the documents that need to be uh, filed with your lender. Um, then we go obviously into the first round of underwriting, what that is. Uh, then there's the ordering of the appraisal. And then we've got the final round of underwriting, followed by the closing documents and signing with title, uh, followed by the closing disclosure. And eventually we get to the funding. So that's what we'll try and cover in this first part of this class. So, first of all, Conversation with a loan officer. And usually this is done, um, often it can be with someone we know or it can be with someone we are going to get to know. But one thing we need to do as a realtor, make sure we match up the correct lender with the buyer. I know that as we've uh, worked in this industry over the past sort of 11 years, uh, it's nice to have two or three different loan officers that you work with or you're comfortable with as a, as a realtor in case your client doesn't have a, a lender. And then think about the character of those loan officers. Um, they need to be able to get on well with your buyer. I know we had, we had two or three that we used to work with in Harriman. Um, one of them was a, a lady, a very, very gentle, soft um, lender that was very easy to communicate. The other one was a, was, was a gentleman who was much more, um, you know, uh, quick and uh, business-like, didn't waste any time. And we would find that, you know, depending on how our clients were, would depend on which lender we would um, encourage them to use if, if we were gonna suggest a lender. Does anybody have any um, experience that they'd like to share or a story or a thought on matching up a lender with a buyer with one of your clients, how important that is. Anybody got any thoughts on that? Anybody had good experiences or even bad experiences that they like to share where they've got the wrong lender matched up with their client? No, well, if something comes to mind, then just uh, pipe in. But it is important that the chemistry is right when you're introducing a new person to work with your client, that is if they haven't got their own lender, uh, it's important that you kind of match them up with someone that you feel they're gonna work well with. 
Uh, otherwise, this whole process will be difficult from, from the, the get-go. Uh, the first thing that that loan office is going to talk about is credit worthiness. Um, and usually this is a, a chat over the phone or a meeting person where they'll talk generally about um, the credit worthiness of, of the client. They'll need to ex uh, establish the expectations. You know, um, obviously, this person looking for a house to buy, you know, what sort of price range they're looking at, how much money they have to offer, um, and, uh, and what their current financial situation is. So that the lender can figure out um, what, what is expected right from the outset. Um, go into some detail with different finance op options. And we'll cover some of those in a, in a couple of screens. Um, anybody else got any other thoughts or comments just on this slide before I move on to the next one? Okay. Well, we're going to give you the first keyword. So hopefully, I'm trying to make these keywords really clear because sometimes I get to the end and they say, we didn't see the keyword. So we're already at 13 past, so we're well through the, the barrier to get the first keyword. The first keyword on this class will be credit, C-R-E-D-I-T, credit. We kind of got that. That's going to be our first keyword in this class, credit. Now, if you haven't got this, you better put your glasses on because I'm making this as clear as I possibly can. You'd be surprised how many of these classes I do and we get to the end and someone will say I, I didn't see the keywords I'm thinking well, I'm trying to make these as strong and bold as big as I possibly can and first of all you should just say them but now I'm putting them on the screen so hopefully we've all got that this is the one you'll need to submit at the end of this class credit all right so first of all let's review the I mean I've got eight types of mortgage loans there may be more and if there is we can add two of these, but these are the ones I'm familiar with. Um, and let's just run through these if we can and see if we know what's going on. And hopefully we have some participation on this section. So 30 year fixed mortgage rate is possibly the most popular that we tend to deal with in this industry. Um, I think we've, uh, we all like the idea of the interest rate never changing. And of course, uh, lower monthly payments than a shorter term loan. Obviously, I mean, a 15 year fixed rate mortgage, your, your monthly payments are gonna be higher. But often people will look at this option as it's, a, as it's easy to work with. Let me just go back on that actually, and ask any questions. Any questions on the 30 year fixed mortgage or, or any comments on this particular type of mortgage? Okay, for those of you who are joining us early in the industry, you'll probably find this is the one that you're going to deal with the most. Well, you personally won't deal with it, your lender will, but this will be the one that often our clients are using. Very good. Let's move to the next one. And uh, this one is the 15 year fixed mortgage rate. Um, generally speaking, we, we see this one used. Uh, for refinancing when you know buyers already got their home and they figure out they bought the home and the interest was higher than what it is today and they'll move in and get a refinance and often they'll move to a 15 year fixed rate mortgage let's see i can never understand why sometimes he's don't load in but Recently, I've had a challenge. Let's just see if we can load that one in again. There we go. Interest rate is uh, set for the term of the loan. Lower interest rate, uh, obviously, uh, better than the, the, uh, the, the long term loans. You're going to get a better rate if you're on this one. And of course, uh, you're going to pay more than you would do if you're on a 30-year uh, fixed rate mortgage, and but you'll pay less interest. Any comments on that slide? Very good. Let's move to the third type. 
Now, this is called an adjustable rate mortgage. Uh, it's very good for buyers who don't plan on having a mortgage for a long time. And you'll find that the initial rate fixed is for a specified period of time. Uh, the initial rates often locked for one or five or seven or 10 years. So it's a much tighter platform uh, to get a loan in on. And of course, low interest rate um, than the other two. Any comments on this one? Very good. Let's move on to the fourth type. FHH mortgage, um, FHA are very popular with young new buyers. Um, it's the Federal Housing Administration that provides the mortgage insurance on loans made by FHA approved lenders. So you've got to make sure if you're going to have this um, type of mortgage that uh, the lender is an approved lender for the Federal Housing Administration. Certainly ideal for those lenders, they'll, they'll push those, they'll, they'll use those often. Down payment can be as low as 3.5%, very attractive for particularly new home buyers. And uh, credit scores can even be as low as 500, which is also attractive for those that uh, have, have struggled or have some struggled credit. So definitely an attractive package here. Um, the, the insurance payments are, are required, so you would have to have mortgage insurance premium payments on this type of loan. Anybody got any questions on that slide? Or comments? Very good. Five, fifth type I've got listed here is the VA mortgage, which obviously we, we know is offered through the Department of Veterans Affairs Programme. Um, obviously you've got to be from the military veterans and qualify for one of these. The great thing about these mortgages is there's no down payment required, which is very, very nice for those that have the ability to qualify for this mortgage. Um, no mortgage insurance, that also reduces your monthly payment, which is very attractive. And of course, the, there will be one upfront uh, VA funding fee. And I think they vary, they're not too much, but they, they do vary from uh, package to package. Anybody got any comments or thoughts on that slide or questions? Very good. Number six, USDA mortgage. Uh, not as popular, um, certainly rural development guaranteed housing loan program, uh, which is provided by the United States Department of Agriculture. So if you're Certainly out here in, in Logan, we may see more of these. We wouldn't see a, as many of these maybe if we were in the, in the big cities. Um, but these also do have some attractive platforms that can be certainly beneficial to those that are um, able to qualify for these. Um, no down payment required, which is very, very nice. And they also offer um, home improvement loans and grants that are available for this type of mortgage. You also find that income limits and property value capped apply for this mortgage. Any comments on that slide? Yeah, I, I have something on that. So that'd be like your areas like um, Eagle Mountain, some parts of yep. Saratoga Springs qualify, and you need to go to the website first to make sure that it's within the area. You, you type, you go to the USDA, web, USDA website, type in the address, and it'll tell you if it's in, in the approved area. But here's the key thing, your lender will typically approve it first and then they package it and send it to the USDA. And then the USDA, it could be seven days, it could be 12 days around Christmas, it was like 13, 14 days for them to actually look at the file and then approve it back to the lender. So it is a very good process for your buyers in those, in those areas that it's approved in, um, but it will take a little bit longer to get done. Very good, Brandon, and thanks for sharing that. Yeah, yeah, you, you have got to have a bit more patience with this, this little package. It's not going to happen, well, often it doesn't happen in 30 days. You're, you're probably looking more like 45, or it could even be longer, depending on how long that process takes. But thank you for highlighting that, Brandon, excellent. Any other comments on this slide or anything you'd like to add? Perfect. Okay, number seven. Jumbo mortgage. 
these can be a lot of fun. So often buyers of expensive homes wanted to refinance quite like the jumbo platform. Um, usually requires a high credit score, so you're up into the sort of 700s or above. Um, you can have a fixed or an adjustable rate on this one and uh, usually requires down payments of 10% or more. But we all know what the jumbo mortgage is. We, we get a bit of a surprise at the end of the term because that's when we're going to pay off most of the mortgage. Any questions or comments on the jumbo? Very good. And finally, the eighth one I've got listed is the interest only mortgage. Borrowers with large cash flow, savings, income, and bonuses like the interest only because they can pay down the principal balance at will as whenever they want to. They've got the ability to do that. Uh, these are usually disciplined borrowers, um, they're familiar with their options, and they make sure that they uh, keep on top of it. Um, useful to buyers who don't expect to remain in the home and uh, usually requires substantial assets for the lender to review. Um, anybody here actually uh, used themselves a, an interest only mortgage or had a client that had used one of these? I actually haven't, so I don't think anybody else here in the platform. Steve, you're not in your head. Do you want to share that one with us? That'd be great. Well, a lot of times your second mortgage is interest only. So not your first so much. Yes, oh, that's right, yes. Of course it is, that's right. Good, anybody else got any comments on that slide? All right, well, let's move on then. And uh, let's look at a few terms. You'll see these terms, particularly those of you who just joined us in the industry, um, you'll see some familiarization with these terms when you get going. Conventional mortgage, that's what we're going to hear about. And uh, basically these are loans that are not backed by the government. Okay, so you'll get these through a private uh, lender. And uh, often you'll be putting down maybe around 20%, uh, but you'll, you know, you'll, you'll be self-contained with a conventional loan. Th these are quite attractive as well if you're, uh, if you've got a buyer um, who's got a conventional loan, often the sellers are attracted to these, these buyers more than some of these other terms that we can look at. And we'll stack these in and we can talk about them. There's a conforming mortgage. Uh, this meets local loan limits set by the government. And then we've got the reverse mortgage uh, where you can get equity from your home, either as a lump sum or a stream of income. And then you've also got your government backed mortgages, which are your loan guarantees for the FHA and the FBA and the USDA. So they're generally the mortgage terms you're going to probably come across when you're dipping into this industry. Um, let's just review those and maybe we can just share some stories uh, from the people that are on this class from any, any of these areas. But uh, Often the conventional mortgage is, is the most attractive uh, or most popular, I think, with, with, with most of our buyers. Um, certainly if they're backing up against a, a government back mortgage, the process can be a little bit more uh, tight on those with um, inspections and appraisals, etc. So let's just have a chat about this slide first. Anybody got any thoughts or comments they'd like to share about any of those different terms or those types of mortgages or experiences they've had with clients. Let's see what we've got on here. Well, 32 people on it. I'll be able to squeeze one person out with a, with a story or a comment on this. I will, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Um, so, okay, so conventional mortgages um, are typically, um, kind of a fallback mortgage if you can't qualify or that property doesn't qualify for an FHA VA loan. Uh, but the, the lot of things that happen with conventional, people think that the home can practically be destroyed and still get a loan on it. And it's not true. You still have to have certain uh, appraisal requirements, repairs and stuff like that on a conventional, such as a roof and things like that. But they do yeah. have, a, it's a lot 
um, less restrictive than a FHA loan. So reverse mortgages, um, my in-laws did that when they were in their 70s. They had their home paid off and did a reverse mortgage. The, the thing about a reverse mortgage that people don't understand is that there's really high fees associated with a reverse mortgage loan. It's really convenient for people to start getting their money back um, on the property, um, whether it's in a lump sum or in so many payments but there's really high fees associated with a reverse mortgage and higher interest rate. And then when they, my in-laws passed away, um, of course the, the reverse mortgage had to be paid off if we wanted to continue to maintain or buy the house back from the, from the bank. So uh, reverse mortgages are really tricky. And so you really have to have a good lender that can explain it very well. And it's on a reverse mortgage, it's good to be part of, of the, of the conversation with your client because you're generally not gonna make anything. It's like a refinance type loan. You're not gonna make a commission generally off a reverse mortgage uh, unless they're using the money for something else. But um, it's something that everybody should be educated on because it's an opportunity for uh, people to be able to pull money back out of their home and still maintain a lifestyle if they don't have a retirement put in place. They can use their home equity as a retirement. You've got a question on that, Steve. Thanks for sharing that. Um, when you were tidying up that particular account with your in-laws, was it a penalty you had to pay on that reverse mortgage for paying it off earlier? No, because they both passed away. There was a clause in there that if they passed away, we wouldn't have to pay a penalty. Okay, good. Yeah, I just wondered about that. Very good. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, anybody got any other comments on any of these or any stories you want to share, it's always good to share stories. We've all got lots of experience we can offer. No, nope. okay, let's uh, move on then to our next slide. All right, so initially we got these disclosures we got to look at um, and we do need to be totally transparent with the lender. Um, there'll be a, a type of a loan estimate that the lender will put together. And I'll just go through these and then we can talk about it. Um, all of which will be needed before going into any type of underwriting and obviously required before any appraisal. And uh, the lender will need to explain those costs and fees to uh, the buyer. So, has anybody here had an experience with a client where they've got going initially with the lender on these initial disclosures and then uh, the whole process has fallen apart or the lender has said, you know, we can't proceed on this just now. We're going to have to wait uh, for, you know, whatever period of time it is. Has anybody had that happen with a client? Yeah, Steve's nodding. Anybody else? I can't see anybody else's faces here. Is anybody else nodding? They'd like to share. If not, I'll have Steve share. Come on, Brandon. We know you have. Brandon's, Brandon's great. He's got lots of stories. And what, what, what I'd really like to find out is how we deal with that, you know, because obviously we have a client that comes to us. They're excited about buying a home. We say, hey, come and meet with Sally, the loan officer, and they meet with them and they're they're, they're, all, they're all excited to get this home. They're moving maybe out of a rented property or whatever. And in that initial meeting, they come back and they call and say, hey, Brandon, you know, thanks for meeting with Sally, but we can't even get going for a couple of years. And the question is, how do we as a realtor handle that response when that comes? Because it's, it, it's devastating when they're all excited and, and we've got them excited about finding the home. So that's really what I want to try and get into a story on this. Someone's up. Is that Elizabeth? We yes. found him a new lender. Yes, wonderful. Come yeah. on, come and share your story. No, right when like the COVID was hitting, I had a lender and I felt really bad because they referred me the client, but we were under contract and they were supposed to do USDA and um, the lender said they couldn't do it anymore. And my earnest money was already there and Another lender figured it out though. So it sucks, but 
some people are better than others. Yeah, it, it is. A so bit I'll, I'll tell you what, I, I, I really haven't had a lot of experiences, be, but I push off. So, okay, when I, when I meet with a client, I give them three lenders and I make them interview the lenders that they want to talk to. And I give them stories about each lender, like, hey, this one I've done 80 plus loans with in the last six years or whatever. And if they tell you it's going to get approved, it'll get approved. This other one, she's phenomenal. She's in the south part of the valley. If you prefer talking with a woman over a man, she's phenomenal. And here's some stories about here. And here's the third one. So I let them choose. And I, and I have to be honest, it's put onto them at that point because they've chosen the lender and they've chosen the person that they like to talk to. And I, I just, I don't have that many things come back to me about the lenders because it's been put on them to make the choice. Very good. But even so, uh, we could have a situation where they chose a lender and then they've gone, the lender's gone through their little package in this initial process and thought, you know, I can't help you right now because your credit score is here and mm -hmm. I need it to be somewhere else or maybe you don't have enough um, assets to be able to let me get a loan to it. And it's, it's how we deal with that disappointment yeah. because that will happen. I think that yeah, was the and key that has happened. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That has how, happened. How, how have you dealt with that, Brandon? Well, um, I've sat down with them and I've said, all right, well, then what are, what are the issues that they've talked about with you? If it's credit, um, if it's income, whatever it may be, and we sit down and, and one lender specifically, um, he has a kind of a, a follow back process after three months or six months if they've had issues. And he has a, um, some attorneys that he refers people to for credit fixing. Um, so there's, there's a process that he goes through specifically. Um, and again, I, I'm not involved with that. I tell them, here's what we'll do. This is the process that you need to do and it's a plan. It's, it may tell them it's six months that you need to do this and we'll reevaluate, but it's up to you to make sure that you make your payments on time, that you send in the letters to get your credit fixed. Um, yeah. You know, you got to put it back on them and say, you know what, mistakes happen sometimes, but it's not the end of the world. Let's work through it. Yeah. The key thing is to say, hey, you know, the next few months are going to pass anyway, and the year is going to pass or whatever the time period is. And during that time, you know, we can we can still keep an eye on what's what's out there, and we can be ready to go as soon as you've got to the place that your lender is comfortable with. Uh, the key thing is to be positive with our clients, and you know that there's always going to be a property available, whenever it is they're ready to to get going, uh, that, that will meet their needs. Hey, Very Stephen. Good. Yes, thank you, Steve. I think one of the biggest mistakes agents make when they get into this industry is they're so excited to get a buyer and they start taking them out and they start showing them houses because the buyer's like, well, I think I want to be between this price range or this price range or this monthly payment. And they don't get them all the way pre-qualified. And the people are like, hey, I found this house. I really want to go see this house because of the way the market is. And you don't have those clients pre-qualified. And then, so you're showing them houses and then you're trying to get them pre-qualified, right? So, and then come to find out that they're not qualified for that dollar amount. And you wasted all that time and you showed them all these houses that they couldn't qualify for. So now you're gonna have to try to backtrack and show them houses that are worth less money that aren't as nice. And then that's a difficult uphill battle. Plus you wasted all that other time um, showing them houses they couldn't qualify for. Now, whether it's you take that time and try to turn it into an education of, for yourself of what not to do next time or show them uh, an education of, of how it works, the process works on showing houses. But I, I would always recommend that you get them pre-qualified or at least try to get them started going through underwriting so that in this market, you're not wasting your time showing them houses that they can't even buy. Yeah, perfect, well, well put. Um, so ideal, get on this early. Let's get in with the lender before we start showing houses. That's the key thing. And, uh, and also uh, just make sure they know they've got to be totally transparent with the lender right up front because it's going to help them down the track. It's no good hiding some pieces of the puzzle because it'll come out eventually and it will, it will be a challenge for them if, um, if it's uh, detrimental to the loan. I think Tracy... Oh. Question, Tracy, yes. do you have a question? I just wanted to make a comment um, along those lines. I think as an agent, 
it, what I'm hearing is, what do you do when they can't get bought by the lender and stuff? They can't work it out. I mean, I've had the experience where I have just been crushed because I was so excited to get this deal going. And to me, I didn't know the right questions to ask my client or questions to even ask the lender, but just listening to the problems of the client and then being able to, as an agent, like I've lost deals because of that. I've just gone, okay, okay. And then they're done. And then they walk away and I don't know what ever happens to those clients. But instead of just giving up, I've learned that, um, like was mentioned before, I think my Steve is to, to actually say, okay, I know this loan officer and this loan officer I'm going to. So me as an agent need, I need to act. I need to still act. I don't want to lose my client. And that's such a big possibility. So I need to act and call those other loan officers and go through the scenarios and at least say, I'm fighting for you as my client, you know, and, and then they can see that you're really trying for them as well. You don't want to lose them and they don't want to not get a house. So it's important to actually go to those other loan officers and say, present the problem and say, can you do anything? Do you think you can at least give these other loan officers the opportunity to save your deal? Great comment, okay. yeah. There, there definitely are some lenders who are um, better at helping people with credit problems. Um, and I think that, in, in all industry, there's, there's, there's better people are doing their job. And I think that I know one lender that we have used, I, I honestly believe because she's proved it time and time again, that if there's any way to get someone qualified, she will find it. And she has qualified people that other lenders have not been able to. And I think sometimes it boils down to some lenders are willing to put in a lot more time because they don't necessarily get paid, well, they don't get paid more money. And they can put a lot of time into something. And I think there are some lenders who get enough work where they don't have to do that. So it is about knowing lenders, knowing what they're willing to do. But just like we say, not all realtors are equal. It's the same with lenders. And like you, Tracy, I kind of feel like if you're working with someone, you want to absolutely be sure that this time they can't qualify. But often these lenders who will spend time will work with these buyers over a period of some a few months and sometimes a year to get them to a place where they can buy. They'll help them with their credit and they'll they'll really invest their time in doing it. And like I said, they don't get paid any more money. And I'm I'm grateful that we know a couple of uh, lenders that will do that. So th they are out there. You just have to ask questions and, and ask for referrals, but there are lenders out there who I believe sometimes can work magic in a sense that a lot of other lenders just won't, won't touch them because they are, they're difficult clients. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, very good. And there is a difference between a bank as a lender and a private company as a lender. And, you know, we, we know the difference, the private lenders are, that's all they do is mortgages, you know, so they often will find ways to make a deal work. Whereas the bank, uh, they have lots of different um, services and mortgages is one of them. And it, it's fine if you can get all of the box checked and you know, you, you're a perfect fit, they're a great fit for you. But if you can't um, match every little uh, checkbox with the bank, you're probably better off with a private company as a lender. Yes, again, if you're employed and you have a good credit score, then you're not usually a challenge and banks and credit unions can be excellent. But if you're someone who's self-employed and, and got some challenges with your credit, you're not likely to get help from, from the banking world. And that's where a, a lender who works for a mortgage company, they think outside of the box. They don't have this small box that if you don't fit in it, I can't help you that they will work. It's And my our friend that we've used for years, she loves the challenge. She loves the challenge of finding a way to get someone qualified that other people could not do. And, um, and, and like I said, it's a lot of hard work, but she's done it numerous times for us and, and she just enjoys that challenge. So they are out there. Very good. Thank you for all sharing. Uh, let's look at some of the documents. Um, that definitely are going to be uh, an interest to the lender. 
Uh, here are some pieces of your W-2, your pay stubs, your bank statements, employment history. Of course, if you're self-employed, you're going to have to have at least two years worth of accounts. Um, and I've had one or two clients that have been a little bit prickly on this, you know. I don't want to show them all my stuff. And I say, you know, if you leave the house, if you want the mortgage, you're going to have to just depart with some of this information. Uh, and it's all confidential. Um, I'm not going to get involved in it. It's going to be the lender that's going to work directly with you. Uh, but in order for that lender to get you the money, in order for you to get the house, you need the money, you've got to be able to part with uh, this information. I know we had one client who was, uh, he got several businesses and um, luckily our loan officer was, was very gentle with him and just kept, you know, working the patch. But he was very reluctant sometimes to, to give information or to give it on time or to give it in fullness or completeness. And, and it, you, you could feel a bit of frustration. And it wasn't necessarily um, any, anybody at fault. It was just his style. And so we as realtors just need to be sensitive to that. If we've got a client that is um, a little bit prickly in this area, let's up front just make sure they understand that all of this information is to help them get into the home. Any comments or thoughts or questions uh, or stories on this slide? Okay, thank you for those of you who are commenting and hopefully we have a few more that will comment as well. Okay, in, and that can take some time um, to get it all going. Um, we'll, we'll go into what's called the first round of underwriting. Now, this is going to be obviously based on document checklists that the lender will have. Uh, you usually take a few days to, to get through, and there'll be some conditions that will be requested when it comes out of the, this first round of underwriting. And if there are any deal breakers, they're going to be revealed here. We're going to find out whether or not this thing can happen. Um, any thoughts or comments on the first round of underwriting? Uh, it is a good, good idea to explain to our clients that, you know, this, is, this doesn't just go into underwriting once and comes out and we've got the mortgage and away we go. You know, this is a process. And you know, when we go into that first round of underwriting, uh, th there are going to be most likely some little flags that will uh, appear that we need to deal with. They're not necessarily all going to be red flags. They could be orange flags or yellow flags, and there'll be some green flags, but there will be some flags that will uh, be raised by the lender or the company that will need to address so that they can get this, this whole package tidied up. And I say to people, often the, the company we're dealing with will not keep this loan. They'll usually sell it on. And so all of this information is important for them to be able to resell your mortgage to another company that will ultimately deal with you long term. Um, any thoughts or comments on this slide? Very good. Okay, this is what we as realtors are always interested in. When we hear the appraisals on the market, then we're all excited about that. Well, we always want that appraisal to be ordered. It's super nice if the lender comes back and says, no appraisal, that makes us super happy. But it doesn't often happen a lot of the time. It does happen. It's fun when that does happen. It's important to also mention to our clients that the company that's ordering the appraisal, they, they can't choose an appraiser. It's going to be done through a third party. They basically... Uh, do not know who that appraisal is that's going to go into the property until they've been assigned. Um, and, it, and it could take two or three weeks to get an appraisal done, depending on how the market is. So and I, the ideal is to, to get this done fairly early on. Um, the, the appraiser is going to look at the value of the house, hopefully bring it in where it needs to be. And I say to my clients, I say, hey, the appraiser wants to make this work. They want to match up a willing buyer and a willing seller. They want to make this work. They're not, they're not going in to think, I don't want to make this work. I want to make it a problem for everybody. They're going to go in there and think, here's the house. 
I've got a willing buyer, I've got a willing seller, I've got a price they're both agreed on. Now let's see whether the, this house will appraise at that price. Because obviously I've got a, I'm working for the loan company and the loan, our company are, are interested in um, loaning money on, on an asset that's worth the money they're loaning. So the appraiser is trying to bring these three people together. And I believe most of I mean, I know there's, there's only one or two that have probably got a different agenda, but I think in every industry you've got some, some bad, but may, mainly speaking, our appraisers are good and they'll do their very best to make this work. Um, but if it doesn't appraise, then obviously we'll need to look at that and that there will be a shortfall that will need to be made, whether it's a, a different agreed price or whether more money has to come to the table. Have we got any stories on appraisers, good or bad stories, that we could share with this group today? I don't know that I have a story. I have a question. Perfect. So I'm a new uh, realtor. I just got my license uh, beginning of February. And Congratulations. Have, oh, thank you. Well done. Um, I have some clients that are under contract right now, and they... Um, they have the appraisal, everything's going well. Is there like a report or anything that we see or is it just the lender kind of tells us where the appraisal came in and then we just go forward on that? Is there paperwork or anything that we receive like going over that or is that just on the lender side? The, no, you, you, the, sorry, the, go ahead. Yeah, the lender will get a copy and so will the buyer. But, okay. but the seller does not, the seller doesn't see it. Usually. Right, right. And so um, just will, will the lender usually send it straight to the buyer or do they usually go through like the agent or do they usually just, it's just between the lender and the buyer? Do you want to carry on, Leslie? Um, my understanding is that the, the, the um, appraiser sends it to the lender and then the lender sends it to the buyer. That's, so that's that's why I just I was just wondering because like we the the lender told us you know where it came in and stuff and I'm not sure if my client got it or I, I that's just some communication I'm not really sure what the process is so this is just a question that like is this something that's a great to question answer, you know that so it, it, usually um, you can always figure out who's going to get what because they're the people that are paying for it so the buyer he's pay, he's paying the money or she's paying the money through the lender, because the lender are going to charge them whatever the price is, a few hundred dollars. And so they will be privy to that report. That doesn't mean to say they can't share it. Often I don't think they do share it. Um, but the, the, the appraisal will appraise the property at a price. Um, how can I put this? Sometimes the appraiser may look at the property and think, you know, this may be worth more, but I'm just going to go in at the price because of other constrictions in the market. Because they, they're also concerned they don't want to push the market up or down with other appraisers that are working in that, in that geographical area. They, they also have some other rules they have to apply to make sure they don't push the market one way or another. So they, they have to, they, they're walking a very tight rope, really, I think. Uh, they, they want to match the, the buyer and the, the seller together. They want to be, you know, uh, true value to the lender. And they also want to be careful that they are not adjusting the market price too much. So sometimes they'll say, yeah, it's coming on price. Or they may say, oh, it's just over. And often we, we as realtors can figure out, well, maybe it was a lot more over than that. If, if, if we know that area where I'm making sense here. But the bottom line is they will get the paperwork and they can decide what they want to do with that paperwork. Okay, yeah, the appraisal actually came in over what we were under contract for, which was great. Um, I just was curious, I wanted to make sure my buyers got what they needed. So that just, okay. as long as like, I will check in with them, make sure they got it. And then, yeah, I don't need to see, it. I'm just making sure that they get what they need. That's, yeah. Perfect. Any other comments or thoughts to help Christy on that question? Yeah, I just want to mention, um, all my clients, do get a copy of that appraisal. Um, I always follow up with them and make sure that they got it because they want them to have it. But a lender will usually have to have them acknowledge that they've received it. There's like a form 
that they have to sign that just says, have you received the, have you received the appraisal? And they have to kind of acknowledge it through a DocuSign. So that's been my experience in the past. I've, every single loan I've ever done, a lender's asked for that. So they'll get that and then they have to acknowledge it. But I always follow up and say, have you received it? And they can say yes or no. And I'll follow up with the lender to make sure that they do get it. Because if they're paying for it, I like to make sure that they have that. That's great. No, that's, and also because the transaction receipt, you know, it asks for that information too. So, yeah. Thank you, Esther, for sharing that. Another thing is quite nice. If you, if, if as a realtor, they share that appraisal with you, it's quite nice to look at the comparatives that the appraiser has used to see whether or not they match up similar to the ones that you are working with when you were looking at the value of the house. That can be a nice bit of education that we as a realtor can gain from uh, seeing that documentation. There also Good. is- an, Any other comments? Yeah, yes. you may be asked by the seller to share the appraisal if you're t if you tell them it under appraised, and you know it's it's you don't have to, but if you want them to budge on price, that is something you may have to consider. I don't know what Steve and Brandon's thoughts are on that, um, but you know they they want proof. <laughs> is, is 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 our experience? I I would I would if in those two for number one if you're canceling because of um, the appraisal not coming in, you're going to have to provide the appraisal. Um, and then I don't have a problem sharing it if I'm negotiating a price down. I mean, there's, it's, it's public information. I mean, it's really not, but it's, it's showing here, here's the validation from an appraisal or from an appraiser. And they may come back and say, well, we still want you to pay more. But at that point, you could cancel by showing proof of the appraisal not coming in for your financing appraisal deadline and still yeah, achieve okay. your earnest money refund. Yeah, Unless and it's the same it. if you do an inspection, you know, I'd say, hey, you've got these items, share. I'd encourage them to share it because then the people can see, okay, yeah, that there are some repairs here or there are some safety features here. You know, we probably need to get them done. And I, so an inspection or appraisal, it's good to share. Obviously you have to have the permission of the, the owner of that document, which would obviously be by yourself. Any other comments? Stephen, let me um, ask you a question. Will you explain yeah. what the buyer's rights are when a home does not appraise? What the buyer's rights are? Well, the, the, the buyer obviously can, can pull out because, you know, obviously they can't get the finances to, um, to buy the property because it's not appraised for the... Is, is, that, is that what you're referring to, Steve? No, I'm talking about contesting the appraisal. Oh, sorry, contest. Oh, yes. All right, actually, we have actually done that once. Yes, so the buyer does have a right to the actual value of the appraisal. If, if you have an appraiser come back and you see that, well, in your opinion, it has undervalued and you've got comps that, that clearly indicate that that property is worth the price that you feel it's worth, you, know, you, you can actually... Uh, put a request into the, the board of appraisers, whatever that one is called. I know I did, we, we, we had one. We had to file a report and then it was reviewed. They sent a different appraiser out there or it gives the appraiser the opportunity to reevaluate uh, their appraisal and see if they can bring it into price. Was that, was that that you're referring to, Steve? Yeah. So so as, as a realtor, we do have that uh, opportunity that we we can question if we've got the evidence and the proof with our own comps, if uh, an appraisal is, is not where we think it should be. Because another thing we need to understand is that often appraisers will come from different um, geographical areas and they may not know this area, you know, and they may be picking up houses that are, I don't know, maybe picking up track houses as comps for maybe a custom build house uh, and not taking in consideration, you know, the extra features or um, upgrades that a certain house would have that would indicate more value. But certainly we as a, a realtor do have a little bit of muscle in the game there and we can contest it if, uh, if, if we have reason to feel that the, uh, the value is undervalued. 
I know, I know, I think we've done it twice, actually, Les Lan and I. I think we've done it actually twice. We had one time when the appraiser wasn't going to budge and they sent another appraiser out and he, he, get, he gave a, a better report and that was fine. And another time we had it happen where the appraiser actually did come back, he reevaluated it and he came back with a bang on price. So hopefully that's helpful. Any other comments on that? And thanks for raising that one, Steve. That's a good point. I have one comment that, that maybe you can do to precursor the issue. Um, and this happened in January with me. Um, we had a custom home just like you were explaining. And there was, there was probably, I wanna say probably 30 custom homes in this neighborhood and then Arrive had built about 250 homes around them. And I was very concerned that the appraiser was gonna start picking all these Arrive homes, nothing wrong with it, but it, there was a definite difference in the quality of home that was being built with Arrive and these custom homes. And I picked out um, six comps and some were just a little bit over the, a year, some were within that. And I gave that to my clients so that when the appraiser came by, he, they had comps and there was a little note that said this, obviously I know that I'm not trying to do your job. I know you're very familiar with the area, but just in case you're from outside of this neighborhood, or haven't done appraisals in this neighborhood. Um, I want to point out that Arrive Homes has put in 250 homes. These are six that have sold that are very comparable to this home. Um, he actually called me and said, hey, I appreciate you doing this. You know, it's not really necessary, but I appreciate that you took the time to make that explanation to me. Um, and, and we had to find appraisal. I mean, it came in, it came in on value, but I don't, there's some kind of miscommunication out there that appraisers don't like real estate agents and vice versa and we can't work together well we can um and i don't think that it's a big deal to put out and say these are how we justified our value and our asking price and um just the the my client didn't say anything to him just said hey this was left by my realtor and i've done that a number of different times i've only had that one time called back but you know it may be with something of value to just show show where you're justifying your value and, and see if something comes different with the appraiser we've yeah. done that We've done that in a in the old neighborhood we lived in because um, there were that they were more custom type homes and there were a lot of track homes around, and like you said, sometimes the appraiser doesn't know that area. So all we're doing is assisting them by giving them some information, and we've done the same thing. We've left um, some comps with the seller, and they've handed them to the appraiser and more times than not the appraisal has been really appreciative because we kind of have helped them understand that neighborhood if they don't know it and also because the appraisers don't you know have a super key sometimes we've actually if it's been local we've just gone to let the appraiser in there if the if that's if the seller is obviously not in the home and we just hey you may find these useful we did some comps and uh my experience is that they've always said, oh, that's great, because that's less work they have to do, because <laughs> what you're basically doing, you're giving them kind of a, you know, a fast, a fast lane uh, on that particular property, because it's less work they have to do. They can just look and say, oh, yeah, this looks good, and they'll put it into their special program, and, you know, that can be definitely helpful. Very good. Thanks for highlighting that, Brandon. Thank you. Any um, other comments on appraisal? I agree yes. with uh, Brandon and uh, Leslie. Uh, I, I really like to go to the appraisals and uh, point out certain things that the appraisers may not know. It may not have been part of the listing. It may be a uh, builder purchase, which are not part of the MLS, because most appraisals, appraisers only get their comps, generally speaking, from the MLS itself, unless they're a local and they know specifically what builders are doing that may not have hit the MLS. But it's worked really well. I, I present it, I don't push anything. I just express my view. I, I tell them this is only to help you because there are some exclusive things about this residence that you may not see or that someone may not wish to communicate to you. And they've always been positive. I, you just don't go walking in on it and, and push to an appraiser and try and sell the house at a price which is higher. You just wanna present the home in the best possible light to them, informing them of 
special appliances, uh, audio wiring that they cannot see, and things of that nature. Very good, very good. Thanks for highlighting. Can, can I add just one real quick thing? Yes. I was talking to an appraiser uh, about a week ago uh, about something unrelated, not just a friend of mine. And he said he always checks the agent remarks in this market right now, especially if there's been multiple offers on the property. So that's where you can communicate that with them, just down on the agent remarks. Uh, as info, we had uh, 12 different offers, six of them above ask price. Um, you know, if the appraiser wants further details, contact agent. And he said he's done that on, on several occasions. Very, very good, yes, very good. Uh, another thing, yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, what Paul said, I think that there are some homes have a lot of upgrades, uh, custom homes, and sometimes some of the upgrades are not visible and some don't add value. It's, it's if you know that there are some upgrades that do add value, that is good to point that out. And you can do that on, on a sheet that you leave with comps. That th This is a list of um, upgrades that we feel add value to the home. Very good. Um, wonderful. Um, also, another thing we can just share with our uh, seller, if, if, if we're representing the seller and we know the appraisal is coming in on, you know, whatever it is, uh, the Tuesday or whatever the date is, it's good to encourage the, the seller to have the home looking like a show home. It's just like they are showing the home because that also makes the appraiser feel good about the home. He hasn't got to walk in the room and clamber over stuff that's all left around. He's already getting a good feeling about the home and he can see it at its very best. So as a seller, when we know when the appraiser's coming, let's just make sure we keep the home as clean and tidy as possible. All right, let's move on. Thank you, there's some great comments there. Um, when that appraisal, that appraisal comes back, it's gonna go into the final round of underwriting. Uh, all of the paperwork will be uh, put into this process. Um, hopefully um, the conditions will be met. However, we will find that there will probably be some other conditions that will raise the flag in the final underwriting. Um, confirmation with total funds that the underwriter will say, yep, yeah, we're good for this amount. And we'll say we're clear for settlement. Um, it is important to remind our client, our buyer, that we're probably not through all of the woods yet. You know, we're through most of it. But often, uh, particularly with self-employed people, um, it will come out of final underwriting and there'll be some you know, requests for conditions that need to be met in order for this to run the course. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll need to make sure we, we are able to do that. Any comments on the final underwriting? Can I say something real quick? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Tracy. So yeah, so final underwriting. I don't know if anybody else has had this happen, but for new agents and stuff, like things happen. Like I always feel like it's my responsibility to educate my client um, because a lot of times, well, from what I've run into, um, sometimes the uh, loan officer can't iterate enough. Don't go buy a new truck. Don't go buy, you know what I mean? Like don't jeopardize what you've got going for you. So I think it's really important to just really get that through your client's head because they don't get it. They're excited for some whatever they're doing. They're buying a new house. They're like, yeah, I can afford to buy this. I can do this. I just qualified for a new house. And I've had that happen before and it just blew the deal. It's like uh, you totally just bombed this one because now your debt to credit ratio is just messed up. <laughs> so I think that's important to make sure we educate our clients as well on that. Perfect. And we'll nose into a little bit of that a bit later on in this class. But yeah. yeah. It, it, it's good advice to tell your buyer to keep real close to the lender at every step and don't make any decisions on anything really until you're good with the lender because it can really mess things up. I know we had a, um, a client a few years ago. He was from another country and he was well qualified and everything. Everything was fine. Um, and obviously he was, he was getting ready for his house. <laughs> and, he transferred a large amount of money from another country. And this was like the day before we were 
and I, I had no idea that he was going to do this. The lender had no idea he was going to do it. And I go to the settlement and they say, we have a big problem. And there's this chunk of money that had come from another country. I think it was from Pakistan, I think. And it was all the jigs, but because it had come into the pot, it had jiggered things up. And now the poor old loan officer, pulling her hair out, she was, how do we fix this? Because, you know, it, it then got to go back into a process to go through that uh, final round of underwriting again. So, yeah, keeping our, our buyers real close to our lender at every step of the way is going to be an advantage for them. The lenders do not like those sort of surprises. Even if they are totally legit and it's not going to be a problem, it's still got to go through that process. So thanks for raising that, Tracy. All right. We finally get those closing documents and we're ready to sign with title. This is going to be done with an escrow officer at a settlement appointment with a title company. And they're great. I've, I'm sure most of you have, have some great experiences with title companies. They're really good at this deal. Um, they'll make sure they've got full copies to the buyer. These days, I'll even give them to them in an electronic format if they want them, or a paper and an electronic format, whatever is comfortable. Um, obviously, they'll need usually two forms of identification, uh, which can easily just be a driver's license or even a Costco card or whatever. So when we get to this stage, we know we're in we're good measure. We're not completely done, but we are really making great progress through this lending uh, procedure. The closing disclosure will uh, completely clear that all Paperwork has been signed. That's what the, the title company will do. They'll also have confirmation of the funds. And uh, once that happens, we then go to the next procedure, which is funding. So when, when our buyer's gone through settlement, they still don't own the property. Um, in some states, it happens simultaneously. But in Utah, uh, there is a process that has to happen. Unless you table funding, usually that process is going to be the next day before we finally get um, the funds moving. And you hear those great words, we as realtors, when we hear the words funded and recorded, we know everybody's happy. We're happy because we're going to get paid finally. I've been working with the client for several months and we know that the client's going to get their home. They're going to be happy. And we also know the seller's going to be happy because they're going to get the funds. But this doesn't ever happen until the funding has been received and the title is being recorded. The escrow officer will usually call us and give us that great information. And then the door will be open and we can get into that property. And uh, when that happens, we're all excited. So let's have another keyword. As Merlin's just popped up there, the number two keyword for this class will be funding. That's F-U-N-D-I-N-G, can you see that? funding i'm trying to make this as clear as you possibly can so none of us miss it you've already had one keyword this will be the second keyword and the second keyword is funding all right okay now we'll get into the credit score this is a whole minefield of stuff and um i'll tell you a story because obviously you know leslie and i we're we're the brits we're from england we've been over about 10 no 12 years 12 years now and this was a whole new ball game. When we first moved over here. Everything centers around the credit score. I had no idea how important this was. But you can't do anything if you haven't got a credit score. And I found out what my credit score was. After I looked it online, I thought, oh, you get to 800, 850, you're really, you're really in the big the league. My credit score was 999. I thought, this is brilliant. I'm 999. Then I found out that 999 means zero. It's even less than the, the students, because they started off at 250, apparently. If you got, you know, it turns 18, they start off with a credit score of 250, which is still pretty low, you can't do much with, but that's like the starting point. But if you're an alien and you come in, you start at 999, which is zero. We're even lower than the lowest of the low. So I figured out before I could do anything. You think that with technology that your credit scores could transfer from one country to another, but that is not the case. 
No, that is not the case. You you come out less than the lowest of the low. So I figured out, okay, I've got to get this credit score up because I can't do anything without a credit score. Okay. So I figured out that you've you've got to have it, and this is worth knowing for anybody who has no credit score or wants to build it up. Ideally, you've got to have five lines of credit. You've got to start off with five lines of credit. And they've got to kind of be a mix. So you've got to have something from the bank, some credit cards, or maybe a private company. So I thought, okay, let's see what we can do here. Um, so, I, you know, you get the credit card comes in, they'll give you $500 for, for nothing. They'll, 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 they'll throw $500 at you just because they think, you know, they, they can get some interest out of you. So you reply to that, you get the $500. So that gets going. Then you find another one that comes in. A couple of credit cards are okay. You don't have two anymore. So I thought, I've got to work with the bank. So I went to, it was US Bank. I thought, they're not going to lend me any money because I've got no credit score. I, I'm sharp enough to understand that. So I went in there with $1,000. And I met with the manager. I said, I need to build my credit because I'm kind of at zero. I'm on the 999 platform, which is, I figured out now, is it, I've been told is zero. He says, oh, right, great. I said, well, so what I need to do is I need to have a, a loan with you, okay? He said, okay, that's great. I'm talking to the manager, by the way. I said, I've got $1,000 here, so I'm gonna give you the $1,000 so there's no risk for you, and then I want you to loan me $1,000. So he looked at me and he said, why am I loaning you $1,000? Why can't you use that $1,000? I said, because you won't loan me a thousand dollars because I've got no credit. He says, "Oh yeah." So I said, "I'm going to give you the thousand dollars, so you've got there's no risk, okay? Because I'm I'm giving you it in cash, okay?" I used to call them Jackson bills. They're the twenties, Jacksons. These are Jacksons, okay? Thousand dollars. So all you got to do is whatever process you have, loan me a thousand dollars. You can put this thousand dollars wherever you want but then I need you to loan me $1,000 so I can pay you back. Anyway, it took me a while to explain this to this manager. He eventually said, okay, I've got it, he says, I've got it. So off he goes, and he comes back in about 10 or 15 minutes after he's worked out what he's done. He said, I'm ever so sorry, he says, I said, he says we, we, can't, we can't loan you $1,000. I said, you can't loan me $1,000? I said, there's no risk. He says, no, he said, we can't loan you a thousand dollars because you've got no credit score. I said, I said, I know that. That's why I need the thousand dollars. Anyway, US Bank would not do it because their system would not allow me to have a loan with them because my credit score was zero. So I thought, what am I going to do? And then someone else, I spoke to someone else about this. They said, oh, you want to go and try the credit unions? because they're kind of like more flexible for students and stuff. So, okay, so if I go to Cyprus and uh, I explain the whole thing to them and they kind of look at me a bit weird because they think I'm talking funny because I'm from England and then I've got this weird proposition. I'm giving them $1,000 and they're going to loan me $1,000 and why do I need to loan $1,000 when I could use my $1,000, okay? So anyway, and I finally get it through and they say, I think we can do that. Anyway, so they came up, they said, yeah, we'll take the $1,000 and we'll put it into an account that you can't access. And then we'll loan you a thousand. I said, that's great. So Cyprus did it. So I went to American, uh, what's it, no, Mountain in America. They did it. So I now got two. So I got my two credit cards and I got the two banks. So if you have someone in this position, tell them to use the, the, the credit banks, the, the, the credit corporations that are more able to do this. So I got I got a thousand dollars in one bank, a thousand dollars in the other bank. They're two loans and I'm paying them back. I got me two credit cards at five hundred dollars a piece. So then I go to I think well we've got to go somewhere else to get something. Let's go to a private company. Well this is where you need to go to. RC Willy, they're brilliant. RC Willy is a private company and they'll give you credit, okay? So we went there, we bought a TV, and they loaned us 
the, 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 they let us buy this TV on, on credit. So that'd be on my fifth platform. And I tell you, within, within six to eight months, our credit score was up into the 400s and 500s just by doing that procedure. So that's the way to do it. You need at least five streams. They've got to be different. And of course, you know, you can have a car loan or something else loan. Um, but if you've got a, a little bit of a, a variety of loans, that, that will help your credit score, even from a complete zero. What happens actually, once we started the process, my score went from 999 to 250. 250 must be like the platform that everybody starts on over here. And then it builds up from the 250. You don't get anything below 250. Uh, but that's how we did it. And, you know, within, uh, within a year or two, you know, we got our credit scores into a reasonable place so that we could do things with it. Anyway, I thought I'd share that with you. That was a bit of a long story. Let's see what we got here. So basically, when you work on this credit, you've got these three credit bureaus that are kind of all working together in slightly different platforms so, but the numbers will come out similar you've got your Experian, your Equifax and your, your, your TransUnion you know if you go to Credit Karma or something you're going to see something like this and that'll show you you know where your credit cards are so we'll cover in this section what is the FICO credit score we'll talk about that we'll talk about how it's compiled we'll also talk about how it affects your loan application and we'll, we'll talk about how you can repair your credit score okay so let's have a look at this first of all i had no idea what this word meant but i figured it out have a its uh, legal name is fair isaac corporation and it was started off a while back in um, san jose california by these two guys bill fair and earl isaac in 1956 um, it's fico score a measure of consumer credit risk has become a fixture of consumer lending in the United States. Probably 90 plus percent of companies use this platform for their credit rating. So it's, it basically is what we're working with. Um, why? Because the FICO store scores are the industry standard for making accurate and fair decisions about credit worthiness. They help millions of people get the credit they need for a home or a car or a special purchase, etc. Anyway, so I want to ask you what that is. The FICO score, it's the Fair Isaac Corporation. And it was put together in 1956 by Bill Fair and Earl Isaac. So there we have it. But I suppose you guys all knew that. So I didn't know it because I came from England. So, but that's what it is, if anybody asks you, okay? Any questions on that little slide? Okay, I'll probably send you all to sleep. Let's have a look at these FICO score factors. So, basically, the, the FICO score eight is the most commonly version, used version in the FICO model. It's kind of about the, the, the modern day one that they use. Um, card utilization, percentage of on-time payments, average age of open credit lines all play a part in your overall credit rating. And this is big stuff. You've got to, you've got to do this. You're not going to buy a house without understanding how this thing works. So I thought I'd sort of segment this up for you so you can get an idea of how this mix works and what you're working with. So you've got a big blue section there. 35% is payment history. You've got stuff that's owed. Counts are owed at 30%. You've got your length of credit history at 15 You've got your new credit at 10, and then you've got your credit mix at 10. So we'll just break that down and have a little look and see if we can learn something on this. So this scoring model is what most lending companies use. In fact, I haven't come across a lending company that doesn't use this. I don't know if anybody else here has come across a company that doesn't use this platform. If you have, shout up, because I don't know about it, but all the ones I've dealt with all use this same model. Okay, so let's look at the 35% payment history. Basically, that's going to cover late payments. They're kind of interested in that. Obviously, interesting collections, very interesting in past year accounts, and they will look at the public records on finances. So that first 35% section there is a big part of the game. That's over a third of your qualification is going to be is going to come from your activity in your payment history. Okay, that's important to understand. 
This next little section, which is the 30%, is stuff that we own. So owed amount on all accounts, number of accounts that carry a balance, they'll look at that. Uh, they'll look at the percentage of credit that's being used. So, you know, if you've got like a 10,000 spend, they're going to see if you're using 9,999 of it all the time, or if you're using, you know, only two or 300 of it. That's going to make a huge difference of how much percentage of how much credit you have you're spending. They're going to look at that carefully. Um, and then they're going to look at the balance, the balance versus the available balance. So whatever balance you have on there compared to how much is available in your balance. This is the next section, the, the length of your credit history, about 15% on that. So basically how long you've had credit. And obviously, you know, you just have to build that up. You, you, you can't push that along any quicker. Um, how long you've been paying your bills on time. That's a real important component there. And of course, um, the time since you've opened an account. And, and we'll talk about this a bit later on, but don't just go closing accounts willy nilly because some of those accounts that have been open a long time actually give you some strength in this credit report. Um, time since recent uh, account activity is important. Uh, and you'll find that if you've got a credit card and you don't use it for uh, a long period of time, they'll probably write to you and say, hey, we're gonna cancel this. Um, and if that's the case, you wanna kind of just put something through it and keep it going because that's gonna help you on your overall credit. Uh, and if you're acquiring a new credit card, obviously if your credit's good, that's an important part of, of this piece of the puzzle. Uh, these other two sections, we've got the, the new credit. So basically they're looking at a mix quite like to see a mortgage on there because the mortgage is usually a long-term loan and it's also a sizable amount of money. So they think, ah, this is, this is pretty good because a chunk of money is coming out every month and that's, that's good. A car is another good thing. And there may be two or three credit cards or, or whatever you have mortgage, uh, sorry, private loans or whatever. Um, you still need to have good scores without the mortgage. That's really important. They're going to look at that with those um, new credit platforms. Uh, department score credit cards are good, are good and, and uh, of course, any financial companies uh, are considered, uh, but it's a kind of a low quality credit for that sort of end. And then finally, you've got your little mix going on here. So number of recently open accounts, that's kind of important. They'll look at that. They'll look at how many credit inquiries are happening with your, with your name on the tag and uh, time since each account was opened. They're gonna look at that as well. And finally, they'll look at how often you're applying for credit. So that can go against you. If you keep applying for more and more credit cards, they may be thinking, ah, oh, maybe they've got a big purchase they're gonna come up with sooner or later. So well, that might, we might you know, give them a negative on that. And then we'll talk about hard and soft and auto inquiries. They're, they're kind of pull into the mix as well. So before I go into these a bit more details, anybody got any um, general questions on this uh, score mod model that uh, FICO uses? All comments? Have I completely lost you? Hopefully I'm not lost you. All right, here we go. This is a fun little section. Well, first of all, look at how this rating works. So basically, you got this 580 as your, your kind of first benchmark. Anything below that, you know, you, you, you really consider a, a risky borrower and you're probably not going to get too much going. In saying that, you, you can still buy a house, you know, if you've got 500 credit, but you are look, looking at being considered as a, as a risky borrower and you're probably going to have to pay more interest. So the next little uh, step is the 580, there's a 669. This is fair. And um, even though it's below it, it's the below average score in the US, it's still uh, reasonably accepted by many lenders that will approve you if you're in that sort of range. Then you've got this 670 to 739, which is good. Most lenders will approve you. If you've got a client that's over 670, you're in good shape. And then you've got the 740 to the 799, uh, which is very good. In fact, often, even if you're in like the late 700s, like 
seven seventy, seventy eighty. They'll put you down as excellent anyway. Uh, but you know, in, in this little section, you, you're, you're really doing well. And then obviously the eight hundred above is exceptional, and you're most likely going to get money from anywhere you want. Uh, any comments or thoughts or questions on that slide? There are a lot of lenders out there who, especially if it's a little slow for them, they will help counsel your buyers. And so if you feel like your buyer has some challenges with credit score, it's a good idea to hook them up to a lender. Let the lender spend six months trying to, to generate their credit score, or help them with their credit score, and they'll be able to purchase eventually. Uh, but it's a good process to get your buyers in. And then uh, you have a nice touch contact with them throughout the whole process. Perfect. Thanks for coming on board, Ty. Nice to see you today. Yeah, great comment. And uh, I, I found that lenders are very keen to help a client get through this, uh, you know, this little process. Uh, uh, because they're dealing with it all the time, they've often got some very good recommendations and they can bespoke those to that client. They can figure out where they are in the, in the place and they can help them. Uh, when we first came over here, we didn't, we didn't have a lender, we had nothing. So I had to figure it out on my own and just talk to different people. But the, the lenders today have some excellent uh, ideas and uh, suggestions that can help any of our clients improve from wherever they are to eventually get them into a home. And sometimes that could take two years, but two years passes by, you know? And the good thing about it is our lenders are working with our clients. And of course, we've got like a little communication line there uh, along with our communication line that can strengthen that relationship so they you know they're always locked into it as when we finally find that home very good thank you all right let's see if we can figure out how this thing is put together it's just quite detailed so i'm trying to give you as much information as you possibly can that can help you so first of all it's kind of a high impact platform this is the credit card game uh, and this will be reported as a percentage and if you look at that little visual there um, the red zone is not the place to be and the green zone is the place to be so um, if you're only using you know uh, under the 29 percent then you're going to be okay basically you're going to keep in the red you you'll still be reasonable if you're in that 30 to half percent 50 30 50 percent but you really want to be in the green section if you possibly can so with the credit card use it matters most for individual cars. So even though we do look at the whole thing, um, they are going to look at each individual card as a standalone uh, little evaluation point. So remember that uh, the average use is also going to be important, but that can be across all of the cards. Ideally, we've got to try and stand at that 30%. Certainly, if you can get to the 10%, so if you've got 10 credit cards and you're just using 10% of whatever your limits on there, that's going to be very, very helpful. Uh, it will definitely strengthen you. you. You're better off doing that than you are saying, you know, having, if you had 10 credit cards and you had three of them up to 30% and the others at zero, you'd be better off having them all closer to the 10%. You certainly wouldn't want to have a number of cars and have one that's maxed out to the end you know you've got ten thousand dollars on that card and you've got three or four other cars and they're all sort of just a few hundred you want to spread it out that is key with the credit card use this is how the calculations work so that if anybody asks you this is how it works banks use your share your finance information with credit bureaus on the same day each month this is the piece of the puzzle that people forget so the bank system, they all operate slightly differently. They're, they're gonna send off a report to the credit bureaus on, on whatever their day is, and that'll be the same day each month. So you're gonna get different reports that are going at different days, depending on where, you, where your money is, if that makes sense. Um, obviously not the same day that you're paying your bill. And that's why sometimes you can see your credit score going up and down because Th these other dates are coming into play that are different to the time you're playing or paying your bill, if that makes sense. This means, yeah, okay, I just said that, yeah, you could be, you could have paid your bill down to zero, but a different number gets posted on your report just because the banks are putting it on a different date, if that makes sense. 
You got that? Okay. Hope I'm not losing you on this. Payment history is important. Another high impact level of how you use your, your, your credit. This is reported as a percentage. And you've re it's difficult, this is, because you've really got to be in that top zone, you know, 98, 99, 100% to, you know, get those, those green bars or yellow bars. So, single 30 or 60 day missed payment, pretty easy to recover from, but it can hurt your credit score more significantly. So, you know, if you, if you miss out a month or two, you can recover from it, but it will give you a bit of a ding on your, on your credit. 90 day missed payment, damaging, could disqualify you from certain loans. So, you know, for three months, you could be disqualifying yourself from certain loans. After 90 days, uh, basically your charge offs uh, are gonna be sent to the collection agency and someone's gonna be turning up on your doorstep. That's gonna hurt you hard on this payment history. Show how this gets calculated. This is quite interesting. Uh, this percentage follows a formula that includes all the possible payments you can make across all your reported accounts. Example. If you had 120 possible payments in your credit history, all right, think about 120 possible payments in your credit history, and you only had three late payments during that time, this is how your calculation would be. You have 120 minus your three, so now you've got 117. You're gonna divide that by 120. It's gonna put you at 97.5. You see where that puts you? It puts you just below the yellow bar. You see how critical that is? You're only missing three out of 120, and it, it's a big ding. So payment history is really important in this game. Uh, keeping our payment history up to date is gonna be an advantage for us if we wanna get some, um, some loans going. If you've got any questions or you're falling asleep, just shout out and I'll try and answer, okay? I know this is a bit deep, but it's, I figured it out because I thought I've got to figure out how this works in order to get my credit up. But this is how it works. All right. This is bad news, guys. High impact derogatory marks. You get these marks, we've got big problems. And these get reported as a number. Zero is really nice. One is a bit iffy. Once we're on the two, three, and four, we're in the deep chamber of the deep blue sea on this. So, avoid derogatory marks. They can stay on your report for five to 10 years. It's a real hit, a real hard hit, this one is. Uh, debt collection, um, debt collectors need proof of information. So if, if you've got someone that's in this, just make sure that they get someone to help them. And if, if things aren't accurate, get it disputed uh, because the debt collectors must have paper proof or some trail proof to what they're, they're working with. And if, if they've not got that or it's not accurate, you can dispute that if you are uh, working with a debt, debt collection company trying to repair your credit. Know your rights. Um, and remember that a debt collector cannot keep calling you. They shouldn't keep doing that. And if they do that, you can, um, you can report them and you can stop them doing that. Negotiating your debt. If it's an old debt, um, you may, and you, you need to obviously talk to someone who, who knows about your particular uh, uh, portfolio on this, but it may be a advantage for you to just let it drop off, let it fall off the end rather than try and pay it all. There may be other ways to deal with balancing your credit rather than paying off the old debt. Remember the Federal Consumer Financial Bureau has excellent resources for debt recovery. This is what they do. They're, they're, they're like the um, they're like the Rockweiler in, in this game. And they know all the ways in which to make you feel bad and get that money back. Uh, so just remember, they've got all the resources. And so we need to do what we can to tidy up things uh, before they get on our doorstep. Public records like bankruptcies, civil judgments, tax liens, public records, 
much harder to remove, much harder. And we'll talk about some of those a bit later before I finish. If there's any information that's incorrect, get documentation and court records to build your case. That's important. That can be helpful. And you can dispute with the credit bureaus to remove uh, a public record. And they, they, they will respond fairly uh, pleasantly if you work with the credit bureaus on that. All right, any questions on that one? Okay, we're gonna sink deeper into despair. Look at this poor girl. This is how you're gonna feel if you've got some of these things, but I need to show you. There, you can get out of it. It's not the end of the world, but I'm just gonna show you some of these pieces of information so that you know uh, what we're dealing with. If we've got a tax lien, um, once paid, you're looking at seven years from filing date or in some cases, depending on what the lien was, it can actually remain there forever. So that's a bit of a challenge. Bankruptcies are usually 10 years from the discharge date. Uh, foreclosures, uh, another 10 years from the, that's from the date of the property sale. We've got judgments, seven years on those um, from the date filed with the court system. Charge-offs, another seven years there from the date of last activity with the vendor. We've got collections, seven years, everything seven years. It's not seven years of plenty of this, isn't it? Seven years of the famine. Seven years from the date of the, the insured date, right? And then you've also got another seven years and anything else that's going on. So we don't want to look depressed or like that. But if you have got a client that's looking a bit depressed in one of these areas, you just tell her, tell them, seven years will pass. And so will 10 years pass. Let's start today and see if we can uh, get you all cleared up, get in with a good lender and let's start building, because you can pull out of all of this. That's the important thing to know. You can pull out of all these items. That's a bit of a depressing one. We'll pull off that screen. Okay, credit aids. This is another kind of area that you need to be aware of with your credit card game or your credit game. Um, and you know, if, if you're up in that sort of seven, eight, nine platform, you're really looking good with your, with your aids. This is a kind of a medium platform as far as impact is concerned. Average age of opening accounts, three to six months. So three years is six months. So three and a half years is a good time to get uh, those accounts rolling. Closing counts. <clears throat> Don't close your oldest credit card. It's what gives you your longest credit history. So you're better off just putting a small amount through it every six months to keep it over because that credit history will keep you nice and sweet on, on this little bit section with your, your credit rating. Auto closing. Sometimes credit cards will lose uh, an old account that never gets used. I told you this earlier. So be careful on that because I just send you a note and say, ah, we've closed your credit card because you didn't use it for the last year. Um, but, you know, if you've had that credit card for several years, it's worth keeping. Even if you just put, you know, $30 through it a year, you can or usually $30 every six months is about what it, it, it works out to be. Keep it going. Um, Falls off when an older account like a mortgage or a student loan falls off your account, your score could drop since you're losing the credit history that came with that report. And usually it's a, it's a lot of money as well on those items. So just be aware of that. If you've got someone coming up to um, completing their mortgage and they're thinking to themselves, you know, <clears throat> we'll pay off a mortgage and then we'll buy the home, uh, you, you could find that their credit, depending on what all the other parameters are, of course, you could find that their credit score could drop too low in order for them to buy the home they want to buy if they were looking to put it through a mortgage. Lenders typically like to see that you have experience using credit lines responsibly. And so that's what this credit age platform is. Okay, let's move on to a bit more interesting stuff because this is low impact. Total accounts, low impact. So let's have a look at what we've got here. So this is reported in, in a number format. So, you know, the more accounts you've got uh, that are operating well, the, the better off you are. Uh, you'll probably see, if you go to like Credit Card or somewhere else, you'll, prob you'll probably see this box pop up. It will look something like this. It will say, so many open accounts and so many closed accounts. So, you know, 16 would be a good measure of accounts open because it kind of shows you've got a bit of experience over a chunk of accounts and uh, 
if you've got 28 that are closed accounts, it might suggest that you've been able to look after credit accounts for a, a long term period and that can be favorable. Number of accounts, that's what you have is much less important than how those accounts are managed. Just remember that. Um, manage at least five different credit accounts. These need to be a variety of different type accounts. So don't just have all credit cards. You need to have that balance, a little bit of, you know, maybe a car loan or a, you know, an RC Willy or maybe the, the credit union loans or whatever it may be. Credit cards, bank loans, car loan, mortgage. Mortgage is always good because it's a big amount. It's every month. And then maybe some sort of private loan is good. So it's a low impact, but it does have some sort of impact on your credit. Um, paying on time will obviously increase your credit score. And it does increase this credit score pretty quickly. If you've got someone who's not been paying on time, within six months, if they're paying on time, it will make a reasonable difference to how their credit score rises. Any questions on that or any of those other screens? Or I completely lost you. Not completely lost you. Hopefully not lost you. Okay. What we got here? Lenders like to see that you've used a variety of accounts responsibly. That's what they're after. Okay, hard inquiries. Uh, we need to know that these are generally a low impact. Okay. We have to have some hard inquiries. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, <clears throat> first of all, we've got these are these are kind of worked on a number basis. So, you know, a couple of hard inquiries a year, you're going to be fine. It's not going to be a big issue. Even three or four is going to be okay. It's not going to hit you too hard. Once you get to sort of five or more, more then that's when the hard inquiries could start to give you a bit of a ding. <clears throat> Can be temporary dings and scores that usually bounce back in three months. Minimize hard inquiries at uh, nine to 12 months before trying to get a mortgage or a big loan. So that's kind of an important factor. You know, if, if you're working with someone and, uh, you know, you know that they've had some hard inquiry from those before we get going on the lending process. They can stay onto your account for two years, but they do... Uh, but the effects will, will fade away over time. So if you've got a couple on there, it's not going to bother you at all. Three or four, a little bit. And if you've got five, six, seven, eight, nine, then yeah, that probably is going to be a bit uncomfortable for your credit score. And you kind of probably have to wait it out a couple of years before you can get uh, going again on that. Hard inquiries can appear as multiple new accounts being opened, which may suggest overspending. So even though you may not be doing that, to the credit bureaus because they're only looking at numbers and figures and facts that are coming in. They may think, hmm, maybe this person is thinking about overstretching uh, a mark that will be uncomfortable for them. And so that's what they're looking at. Be careful, keep hard inquiries below three or four a year. One or two will even be better. Any questions on that slide? It may be useful to point out as well, especially in the context of a mortgage inquiry. Once you do a mortgage inquiry, your buyer will have 30 days of as many mortgage inquiries as they wish with zero impact beyond the first inquiry. Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. And it's the same with cars as well. The autos work similar sort of thing, uh, but that's a very good point to raise. Thank you, Ty, for raising that. Gave me a chance to have a drink as well. Good. So... All good, let's see what else we got here. Oh yeah, make sure inquiries for a car loan are uh, soft inquiries. Uh, you can say this would be a soft inquiry because you don't really want them to do a hard inquiry for the auto. And they can do as many soft inquiries as possible, which of course have no impact, which is really good news. Soft inquiries are not linked to specific application for new credit. So they do not affect your credit at all. So when you've got a client going in uh, and someone looking at doing a, a credit inquiry, just remind them to use that word soft and that will not touch anything to do with their credit. Giving permission to a potential employer to check your own credit report is a soft inquiry will not impact your credit rate. Pre-approval for offers from lenders, such as insurance companies, credit card companies, etc. all soft inquiries 
the amount of Fed credit rating. Soft inquiries are not disputable, but are available for reference, which is kind of nice. Any questions on that? Okay, so I've kind of got a bit of detail there for you to give an idea of how this credit score works. Um, hopefully that's been helpful. Um, but the good thing is, even if we've got a client that's, you know, deep in the deep blue sea of hurt on this, they can recover. We can pull out of it. And, you know, even if it was only a few, well, even if it was seven or 10 years, that, that is going to pass. And they can pull out and, and we can be clear. Oh, here we are, Mr. Merlin's back. So let's see what we've got. Number three. I bet you all know what this one's going to say. Soft. That's what we're after. Soft credit. So soft will be the third keyword for this class. And we're nearly at the end of it, which is good. So I've given you three keywords now. I'm trying to make it real clear what these keywords are. And um, it's the division of real estate that tells us we have to do this. So that's why we're doing it. But I'm okay with that because at least we can sit at home and do these classes so we don't have to all travel to a, a place. Uh, so if that's what they want, that's what we do. Soft is your third keyword. Okay, as we wrap up this little class, let's look at a few do's and don'ts. They're just simple things. Um, and we can make, make a note of these or do a screenshot, which will help our buyers just be uh, sharp on the on the edge here. So we've got some things to do. We see that stop sign, we've got some things to stop doing. So that's some of the things we should do. Five do's. Periodically check your report. That's important, know what's going on. And the credit card is a really good one. Often banks will have a little report in there as well. Uh, you can find lots of free platforms where you can get a, a, an easy report. Uh, but check it regularly, you can see where you are. And then if you need to tidy up, it's, it's easy to, to work with. Really important, pay your bills on time or early. That makes a huge difference. Pay your bills on time or a little bit early. That would make a huge difference with your credit score. Uh, past due accounts, just get them paid. First of all, get them paid and then just keep them current. Keep balances under 30% of your available limits. So it's not all of your, st all of your stuff, but all the little pieces together 30%, okay? So I might have this credit card that's 10,000, keep it under 3,000. I've got this credit card that's 1,000, I wanna keep it under 300, okay? I've got another credit card that's 20 grand, I wanna keep it under 600. So you're trying to keep each of the pots under the 30%, that's the key. If you keep it lower than that, it's even better. And it's okay having lots of credit cards, you could have two dozen credit cards and just have a little bit on each of them. They like that, they like to see that. OK, it's better to do that than have two credit cards and they are kind of nearly maxed out all the time. Does that make sense? So that, that's that's the key thing there. Also a good idea to increase your credit limits, uh, especially for people with new credit, increase them annually. That way your, yeah. your utilization can go up and not penalize you. Correct. And you'll find that if you're using the credit cards correctly, they'll usually just send you a letter. They'll say, Congratulations, you've been looking after your credit card. We're going to increase it by whatever. And so that, that's another good indication that the, they're, they're sending the right messages to the credit bureaus and basically saying to you, saying to them that you are a good uh, borrower. So that's key thing. Thanks for highlighting that time. Um, active cards. So, you know, just put something through them every six months. That's the key thing. And it can just be a small amount. You know, you just buy $30 of fuel and put it on that card twice a year just keep the card open <clears throat> any questions on the five do's all right get the stop sign out in england our stop sign is round by the way i quite like the octagonal one okay five don'ts here we go one of the things a buyer thinks about doing and we've all done it we think oh i'll Close my account so I can get my house. Well, talk to the lender first. Don't just do it. Closing your credit card accounts could hurt you, particularly if you've had them open for a long time. Better to keep them open and get the history benefit from them. So check with the lender first. Max it out. <clears throat> Don't max out or overcharge your credit cards. That's bad news. That's going to give you a nice little ding on your, your numbers. 
Um, Pre-approval credit cards, try not to apply for them when you're going through this process. Talk to the loan officer first, uh, because that could also be a bit of a challenge for you with uh, getting a mortgage. And don't do this one. This is another one. They, they come on, they say, hey, bring all your credit cards together and we'll put them on one card and we'll consolidate it and you'll pay less. Well, you don't want to do this if you're looking to um, get a mortgage. You want to keep them all spread out. Um, because th th this, this will give you a big ding, because what will happen is you'll end up with one account that's, that's highly uh, su uh, subscribed to, and, and, and that will give you a, a hard hit. So don't consolidate them. But on all of these, you work through your lender, because they know the rules. And old collections, just don't pay it off. Talk to the lender first, because often it's better to let them drop off than pay them off. Does that make sense? Okay, we got through that slide. Let's see, I think I'm about at the end here. This is what we covered today. So we talked about the loan process and we went through a chunk of stuff there. And I was grateful for all of those of you that shared your comments and stories. That was much appreciative. Then we went through the credit score game and we went through a chunk of stuff there. That was a little bit detailed, but I thought it might be helpful to you. And then finally, we looked at a few things we want to try and do and not do to hopefully keep our credit in line. So there we have it. Um, we got to the end there. Thank you so much for being with us today. Anybody got any uh, comments or final questions or anything they want to add before we close up this session? I'm closing you up a bit earlier today by the looks of it, which is nice. Well, thank you again for being with us today. It's uh, been a joy to have you on this class. I hope you've uh, found one little nugget that might help you raise the bar in, in your uh, performance as a realtor in this industry. I'm gonna let Leslie Ann now just tidy this up and finish up with some of these, uh, these uh, tidy up items so that we can get your credit hours logged in. Leslie Ann. Okay.